In the world of data protection and availability, one thing's for certain. You can never have too many copies of your hypercritical data stored at multiple geographies for those what-if scenarios. Veeam has incorporated a feature set known as Cloud Connect that enables our customers to not only back up, but also replicate into one of our Veeam cloud and service provider partner data centers. This not only enables another location to store backup data for those what-if emergency situations, but it also provides DR as a service so that you have the ability to replicate and fail over in the event of a major site outage. Okay, now that we're in the lab, let's take a little bit deeper look into Cloud Connect replication, what options we've got available, and how to set it up. The first thing that we need to do is connect to our service provider. So to get started, you navigate to Backup Infrastructure. You'll notice that there is a Service Providers tab on the left-hand pane inside the main console. Once you navigate to Service Providers, if you've already connected to yours, you'll see it listed here. But if not, we can hit Add Provider from the ribbon menu or right-click out in the white space and click Add Service Provider. Now in this case, we've already connected to ours, so we simply are going to hit Properties and look at our options. The first thing that you'll need to do is add in the IP or the DNS name and associated port number that your service provider has given to you. Now you'll notice a little checkbox here at the bottom. This is an option that enables the service provider to remotely manage and configure your Veeam deployment. And this can be used if you're paying for a little bit more than just DR as a service and you want full-blown management using the Cloud Connect tunnel that we talked about on the light board, the service provider can actually remotely manage your Veeam deployment. Now once you hit next and it verifies the SSL certificate, you'll need to supply your credentials that the service provider has provided for you. Now if you need to add those in the first time you make a connection, you hit add, you'll see username and password. And if you've already connected before, you could select from a list of available credentials that you have previously populated. Now from here, when you hit apply, this is where it actually goes out to the service provider and establishes the connection and retrieves a list of services that you've subscribed for. Now as you can see here with our particular account, we've got not only backup storage, but we also have some replica resources. So we cover the backup piece in another video. So if you're interested in Cloud Connect backup, make sure to check that video out. But we're going to skip right to replica resources. So here you can see a list of all the resource requirements that you and the service provider have discussed ahead of time. You can see that we've got 8 gigahertz of compute and 30 gigs of memory allocated roughly. And also notice the production storage allocation on the data store. Now remember, this is production storage on a data store, not repository backup storage. Also, you'll see a list of cumulative networks that you need configured and also public IP addresses if you happen to need any for access. Now, with regards to public IPs, if you have several different machines and workloads that need to be directly available on the public internet, you'll need to make sure that you inform your service provider so they can adequately give you the amount of publicly routable IPs that you'll need so that when you do a failover, all your workloads are available on the internet. Now finally, we get to the network extension appliance section. Now again, if you're going to a service provider that runs VMware or Hyper-V, chances are the NEAs will be in use. But if you're going to a service provider that chooses to leverage vCloud Director as a management layer on top of vSphere, likely the NEA will not be needed. They'll be managing networking on their own. But here you have an option to add one or several network extension appliances. Now remember, we're on the customer side, so we're on your side, not the service provider end. So that means if you've got more than one network that needs to be routed, one or more networks with actual gateways, so you'll need to add an NEA per routable network on your side. So this is where you can simply add multiple NEAs based on the amount of networks that you need to configure. And when you edit an NEA, so if we just edit the one that's already here, you'll see an options list that you get. You're simply telling it where it can be deployed. So you need to specify a host, a resource pool, data store, and network in this case. Also the IP address, if you're running DHCP, then it can simply pull an IP automatically. Otherwise, you'll need to statically assign it.
And then once you're done with that, you hit apply, Veeam will manage the deployment of the NEA for you, do all the configuration, and once that's deployed, it's a one-time process. Now from there, after you've connected to the service provider, you've enumerated all the services that you've paid for, you've deployed your NEAs, now it's time to actually do the replication job. So as you can see here, we've got one job that's already targeting our service provider. But to give you the full effect, we're actually going to walk through and create a new replication job. And the reason I'm doing this is to show you the destination tab in a moment. So we're just going to do test for the job name. And again, you can name this whatever you like. You can enter in a custom description. And there's three very important checkboxes here below. You've got replica seating, network remapping, and re-IP. So seeding means that you want to take a backup of whatever VMs that you plan to replicate locally, save them on some sort of removable or external storage, physically ship them over to the service provider's data center where they can then do the restoration local and get your replicas teed up and ready to go so that when you need to start that initial replication, you won't have to do the full data transfer. It'll only be incremental updates that have to go over the wire. Your other option is network remapping. So this is going to be important if you need to map virtual networks if the names were to differ between production and DR. And then finally, if you have to do any re-IP addressing where you may run different IP schemes at the target side versus the source side, these checkboxes open up additional tabs that you can see here on the left where you can get much more specific with your settings. So in this video, we're not going to cover all the ins and the outs of the replication job itself. So moving right along, if we simply go to add, let's enumerate the lab that we're working in now and let's pick a VM. So we'll just grab, let's see, this domain controller just as an example. Now you do have the ability to add groups and tags and containers where you can use the exclusions option if you like, or you can manually choose VMs to replicate like I've done here. You can also modify the source if you want to pull this particular VM from a very specific repository. This gives you that option. Uh, or you're going to pull it directly from production, just like the automatic selection is stated here, production storage. Now, when we move through, this is what I wanted to show you. So when you get to destination, typically if you're using replication and you own or control the secondary DR site and you go to choose, you're simply going to choose VMware. Right? And in this case, you could enumerate down, you could go all the way down to the specific cluster, and let's say you just wanted to replicate down to this disaster recovery infrastructure cluster. Right, This process would be the way that you would do it if you manage the DR site. Notice the options that it gives you, a resource pool to select, a folder, and a data store selection. However, in our case, we're going to choose cloud host, because this is what you select when you're doing Cloud Connect replication. Now notice in this case, once we enumerate the service provider, it's only going to show you the hardware plan that they have set up for you on their side. That's it. You don't get to keep digging down. It's simply Cloud Failover is the name of it in this case. And that's going to be named whatever your service provider calls it on their side. Okay. Now, once you select this, the only other option that you have available is data store. But notice when you hit choose, likely you're only going to have a single data store. There could be use cases, however, where you work out with your service provider that certain VMs need higher levels of IOP performance, such as SQL database servers or things such as this that have a lot of random I.O., so they can actually add multiple target data stores that you can replicate to within your single hardware plan. So you may want to choose a specific data store for certain VMs and not others based on capacity versus performance. So in this case, we only have the single data store, so we can leave that selected as default. And from here on out, the rest of the settings in the job are the exact same as they would be if you were doing a regular replication. So in other words, the job settings are going to be the same. You simply choose an on-site repository for replica metadata. You do have the ability to add suffixes if you like, restore points to hang on to target side. 
data transfer. If the service provider has enabled WAN acceleration for you, then you'll be able to leverage it. But in this case, notice WAN acceleration is not turned on. Okay. Also notice when you look at proxies, you'll see service providers proxy. Because when we do replication, we actually leverage two proxies, one at the source, one at the target, to build that connection to transfer the data once we've processed it. But in this case, you don't get to choose the target side proxy because it actually lives in the service provider's data center. And then finally, you've got guest processing. You definitely want to have this enabled if it's a highly transactional server to make sure that it's application consistent before we replicate it. And then your schedule, you can schedule this just like any other job. Now, once all that is done and the replica has been created and updated at the target side, you'll see all those replicas under the ready state underneath the replica's main header here, as you can see. Now, they're all ready to go. You can see this one right in the middle is the one that we've got in the service provider's data center. And you can see that it's associated with the type of cloud instead of regular. So it's very transparent from an end user perspective. It's going to show up right alongside the rest of your replicas. The only identifier is going to be the type, maybe the job name. You've got something plugged in that indicates cloud and then the replica location. So this will be the DNS name or IP of the service provider. So when we look at the different types of failovers we can perform, like we talked about on the light board, you've got full and partial site failover. Now, if you're still able to use your Veeam console like we're doing here and you choose failover now, this is by design going to be a partial site failover because the idea is if it's a full site failover, that would mean that production is offline anyway. So your Veeam server could not communicate to the service provider to actually trigger a full site failover. So anything that you initiate on your end qualifies as a partial site failover. Now you can do a planned failover. You can also build out your failover plans here if you like. And if you have pre-built failover plans that include cloud replicas, you can also start those from here. Now, anytime you initiate the replica failover from this side and the NEAs are in play, that's where we build that layer two LAN extension. To initiate a full site failover, you would either need to call the service provider, let them know that you're down, you need them to initiate your failover plan, or you can access the self-service portal that we do provide and the service provider can make visible to you over the public internet. So as long as you can access the internet, you can log into the portal, use your username and password, the same as you authenticated initially, and then from there, you can trigger your failover plan. So hypothetically, if your site went down, you could actually trigger a failover of your business from your mobile phone. So it's a very, very powerful functionality that we've built into the software, the Cloud Connect series of features, whether it's Cloud Connect backup or replication. The replication piece, provides DR as a service without introducing network complexity to you, the end user. Thank you so much for watching this video. And don't forget, there's a lot more great content on veeam.com under the learn section. In this case, including a deep dive lightboard session that I've put together around Veeam Cloud Connect as an overall capability that Veeam has built in. So make sure to check that out where we get on the lightboard and look at all the different components that are required to achieve Cloud Connect backup, as well as Cloud Connect replication, how the data flows and what options you've got as a Veeam customer. Thank you so much for watching the video.